What's the latest on the Fermi paradox? The Fermi paradox. Is there okay. some? Is there emergent thinking on this? Well, uh, just let me set, set the stage here. Enrico Fermi famously yes. declared, "Where are they?" Given the size of the galaxy and the fact that the galaxy has been around a long time, that there's plenty of time for a civilization to rise up, send out a mission to multiple planets, pitch tent, use local resources to build more rockets, and go to two planets, four, eight, 16. You can do this in hundreds of millions of years easily. Right. Without even warp drives or anything, right? One-tenth the velocity of light. One-tenth the speed of light. Right. Very modest for any modern <laughs> civilization. Yes. And still not us. We're not in that category yet. Uh, and if that's the case, the galaxy could and should be teeming with alien civilizations. So where are they? What's the latest? That's what he said. Where are they? Yes. Okay. I wrote a paper on this in 1993. It was called Implications of the Copernican Principle for Our Future Prospects. Okay. And astronomers love the Copernican Principle. It says your location is not likely to be special. We live around an ordinary star and an ordinary galaxy and an ordinary supercluster. We're used to this idea. It's been used by Huygens to uh, calculate the um, distance to Sirius, arguing that why should the sun be the brightest thing in the universe? These other things are stars, and they're just like the sun. And so what if they were, uh, knowing how dim it was, uh, he got the distance to Sirius accurate to factor of 20, which was extraordinary. I didn't know he did this calculation. Brilliant Huygens. step to make. So yes. Christian Huygens, yes. a Dutch polymath, right. yes. And I own one of his books, a charming book, Mm. A celestial worlds discovered. Uh, mm. We just speculates on what life would be like on all the planets. So he looked at the sky and said, maybe if the sun is ordinary, so are these other stars. Is that right? Right. So if the brightest star in the night sky, Sirius, is just like the sun, how far away would it have to be to be as dim as we see it, right. given how bright the sun is right. in front of us today? To, to even have that thought. To have brilliant. that thought is brilliant. Really? Yes. Okay. But the most spectacular success of this was when Hubble discovered that all the galaxies were fleeing from us. Edwin Hubble, the man, not the telescope. Not the tel. They named it after him. Yes. <laughs> They're all fleeing from us, and the further away, the faster. It's a homogeneous expansion away from us. We did not go fall for the. We're not going to say we're at the center anymore. We're not going to fall for that again after Copernicus. We're going to say. Why would we be in the one special galaxy for which all the others are fleeing? No, no. If it looks that way to us, it must look that way to everyone. You live on any galaxy, it's, you've got to think that you're the center and you've got to see it uh, all of them expanding away from you. Then you get a homogeneous expansion like uh, pennies on an expanding balloon. Each penny sees all the others moving away from it and it thinks it's at the center. And then you get the, the homogeneous models of general relativity, Big Bang models. And Gaumau and his students, Herman and Alpha, then calculated that there would be hot in the early universe and that we uh, could see the microwave background radiation left over from that today. All of that based on this assumption. That you're not special. And you get all of that. And then this prediction uh, was that there'd be microwave background radiation left over from the Big Bang of de five degrees. And I worked with Penzis and Wilson in graduate school, did a project with them. I, you, I observed on they the got telescope. The Nobel Prize for that first measurement. They discovered the microwave background, 2.7 degrees. This is like predicting that a flying saucer 50 feet across is going to land on the White House lawn and one 27 feet across actually shows up. <laughs> this is the most extraordinary <laughs> prediction in, in astronomy. And it shows how powerful the Copernican principle is. So my paper in 1993, which people should remember, you know, here's its answer to the Fermi question. It's real simple. Just to be clear, you're purely invoking the Copernican principle to arrive at this conclusion. Yes. Not fundamentally differently from the way Gamow yes. invoked the Copernican principle layered onto the data available to him at the time. Okay. And Huygens. And Huygens, yes. yes. Right. So here's the answer from the Copernican principle, and it's very simple. A significant fraction of all the extraterrestrial and intelligent observers 
must still be sitting on their home planet or else you'd be special. If there's a giant galactic empire out there that we don't know about, they've conquered the whole galaxy and they're just hiding, you know, they don't want the likes of us to know. We're in a little experiment for them, you know. That would make us special. Because if you're an intelligent observer, you should be one of the people in the big, the, the big one. Okay. In fact, you can say if you're a person on the world today, you should likely be born in one of the countries that's above the median. Half the countries in the world had, when I looked at this, a population less than 7 million. You're born in America. That's one of the, th like, three big countries. You don't have to be in the biggest country. I had a mentioned this to Stephen Hawking once. He said, I should, according to this principle, I should be from China. I said, no, that's a minority of the people on the earth. You should be above the median, which is 97% of the people living on the earth live in countries above the median. Little bitty countries with small populations, you're not likely to be from there. You're likely to be from a random place. And what did he then say? He smiled at me. <laughs> That's the way Stephen Hawking was. <laughs> he gave me his characteristic <laughs> smile. <laughs> One time I had dinner with him and I asked him a question and it takes time. I mean, he, plus he's eating, but he has to spit it out because his throat doesn't work, but he tastes the food and he's typing out replies with his eyes, right? right. On, his, on his device. Right. And I said, how come Isaac Newton didn't figure out how to stabilize the solar system and he needed Laplace to figure out perturbation theory to right. show that every time a planet goes around, it's not tugged out of its orbit by Jupiter. Because right? Newton was upset about it. He didn't know. He didn't have an answer. Right, right. In fact, he credited God for coming in and fixing things every now and then. So I posed that question to him. And then 15 minutes later, out comes the answer. It's, you can't think of everything. <laughs> I, know. I know, that's that, great. That was a dew drop of wisdom. And then he went on to say, Einstein didn't think of black holes. Right, right, right. right. You that's, can't think of everything. That's right. People got Nobel prizes off of black holes Right. that he didn't predict off of his own theory. He predicted gravity waves. That got Nobel prizes too. That's right. Crumbs off his plate. He didn't even get it for general relativity. I know, I know. That's, it, great. You know. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me restate what I think I understand is your point yes. with the Copernican principle as published in 1993 in Nature. Right, right. So powerful is this idea that we're not special. Right. In a statistically large enough sample of things that if all the aliens were colonizing all the planets, we'd be one of those aliens colonizing the planets. You would be, you should ask yourself, why am I not a space colonist? You and I are continental colonists, and the fact that we're still on the Earth tells us something. For example, what's the chance that we will colonize the whole galaxy? There's a billion habitable planets out there. The Copernican Principle says the odds against us doing that in the future are a billion to one against. Why? Because if that's the truth, if that's what happens, what's the chance that you are living on the first planet out of a billion that people live on? A billion to one against. And let me make this a little, give you another example. I know that there's 11 people born in Antarctica. That's all. Are you born in Antarctica? No. They're born south of everyone else. So you're not likely to wake up and find out that you're the most southernmost persons ever born. You're not one of them. There's only 11 of them. There's 8 billion of people out there. So you're not, <laughs> you're not likely to be one of them. Yes. So this puts some constraints on our future prospects. Now, if you ask me, can we become a multi-planet species, like two planets, like us and Mars? Well, if that happens, you're on planet one instead of planet two, there's a 50% chance we could do that. Let's do that. That might as much as improve our long-term survival prospects of our species by a factor of two, because we'd have two chances instead of one. Okay, I was never a fan of that as an argument. I think we should be a two-planet species just because it's fun, not because for survival reasons. Well, um, I gave a talk on this. Yeah. Elon Musk was the other person giving the talk. Yeah. 
And I said, my spiel, yeah. it's good for our survival that we have some lifeboats. Yeah. You know, like a common might more than one this. basket. You store your books. You don't store them all in, this, all in the Alexandrian <laughs> Library. It's going to burn down. Protect as well as you. The only copies we got of Sophocles' plays are the ones that are stored elsewhere. Life has used this to help survive, spread out, multiply, you know. I gave my talk, and he gave his talk. He said, well, I like those survival arguments, right? But I thought we could just go for fun. He said exactly that. He famously said, I don't want to die on Earth. I want to die on Mars. Not on impact. <laughs> <laughs> he said that. I missed the second half of that sentence. It's an important half.